Check the consistency of your stool while we talk this week's Initial Thoughts. Welcome again, Trek nerds, as we review the seventh episode of Lower Decks' third season, a mathematically perfect redemption. I've got a debris field full of spoilers if you'd like to scavenge somewhere else. This is the oddest bird so far in the Lower Decks series. It's not an Easter egg hunt and tries to tell a classic TOS-era story while being decidedly Lower Decks. We're dropped into Peanut Hamper's perspective where we last left her in the battle with the Packlids from the end of Season 1, which leads into a lovely like for me, transitioning to the opening credits set over the debris field from the battle and the wonderful muted reorchestration of the opening score. It really helps set the tone of this not being your normal episode. Within the debris field, we see Rutherford's first implant, which I thought was a nice touch. We also see a castaway Wilson-like character named Sophia that Peanut Hamper has created for company. While she cobbles together a ship out of some sort of probe and uses it to escape the Drukmani we previously saw in Terminal Provocations. And we'll come back to them in a minute. She ends up crashing on the planet Areolus. <laughs> in a seemingly pre-warp civilization of bird people known as the Arior. Per the title of the episode, it appears as we go that Peanut Hamper is redeeming herself and growing as a character by helping this village and being elevated to a kind of godlike status. It then devolves into this weird love story between Peanut Hamper and Rauda, and Lower Decks writers take a like for infinite diversity in infinite combinations. This is a very distinctly Star Trek moment and seems a natural outgrowth in the exploration of synthetic rites. In the post-coital moment, are those flowers shooting up little phalluses? Anyway, this is where we learn the Arior were once spacefaring and have ships they don't use. Because war. War never changes. Or something. This race almost feels like a callback to the Capellans from TOS's Friday's Child. We get this awesome seasons-changing montage to denote the passage of time all the way to Peanut Hamper and Rauda's wedding. And I thought it was fun that the bride replicates a beak. This is where the tone of the episode completely changes, and the Drukmani show up again to salvage the Arior's unused vessels. Despite the risk of court-martial, Peanut Hamper finally sends a distress call, and 16 minutes into the run, we see the Cerritos and our lower deckers for just a few seconds of screen time. This really is a brilliant gag, taking us away from our top-billed characters for an episode, especially when next week we're promised a mini-movie. Peanut Hamper finally takes on the tough, possibly self-sacrifice mission she wouldn't previously, and ends up taking down the Drukmani just as the Cerritos shows up to witness her moment of bravery. But you didn't think Peanut Hamper had actually learned anything and made it off our worst ensigns ranking, did you? Turns out the whole thing was set up and Peanut Hamper called the Drukmani and told them where to find the ships, just so she could ingratiate herself and return to Starfleet. My one dislike for the episode comes from here to the end, where it feels mostly like filler to pad out the runtime, with the Drukmani continuing to attack the Cerritos even after the deception's revealed. It gives Rauda a chance to show his people are still capable of embracing tech, as he's the one to take down the Drukmani, whose captain is again played by the wonderful J.G. Hertzler. And after Peanut Hamper's arrest, we're treated to another of our favorite recurring track actors, Jeffrey Combs. Again, as Agamus, the megalomaniacal computer, as Peanut Hamper now takes the slot next to him at the Daystrom Institute, and the two set up possible foreshadowing of things to come. This is the best possible ending we could have gotten here, and gets a like. I really hope it culminates in an episode where the Universal Translator is taken over by Agamus, and we literally get Jeffrey Combs playing every character. But that's just this fan's dream. I thought this episode was overall just okay. It's certainly not bad, but very different. If you haven't yet, go check out our look at the best and worst villains across Trek, and we'll see you back here next week for Crisis Point 2 Paradoxus. Until then, I've been your host, Dustin Wing.